Thank you. Um, next up, we have Kate Ferguson with Strained Girl, an autobiographical song exploring the effects of neoliberalism on young women. Thank you. <laughs> Need to share it with everybody at, at home or on the Zoom rather. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to sing you my song first without any context, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about myself and about the song afterwards. I know there's not lots of time, um, but I'll do what I can. Okay, this is um, Strange Girl. <laughs> Um, thank you very much for listening. Um, um, so I'll just give you a little bit of background on what I do. My name is Kate Ferguson. I'm studying for my PhD at the University of Plymouth. Um, and it's a practices research PhD, which is great for me because it means that I can do a lot of the stuff I was doing before and um, try and get some sort of qualification out of it, which is fantastic for me. Um, it also means on a more serious note that I can um, 
try and uh, find a bit more meaning and impact in the work that I'm doing and think really critically about it. Um, as part of my work and my songwriting, I've been working with uh, women at the local domestic violence shelter uh, in, in my city. And we've been running sessions called Tuesday Tunes um, and um, uh, the, the research tries to encourage women to sort of write their own songs, whether or not it's about their own experiences or whether it's not. And um, the, the research is all about how to uh, sort of in include these women in the project without co-opting um, their experiences for myself. And that that's the, um, my supervisor, Julie, knows that's the line I've been constantly trying to dance um, so far. And Strain Girl was the album of songs um, that I've done for the first year. And that was mostly based off my own experiences and, and observations. And we'll see how the project kind of develops after that. So um, Strained Girls is a commentary on the challenges that modern day women, especially teenage girls and young women, face in the world of neoliberalism. So um, Halleluk uh, points out that women today are constantly pulled in different directions due to the pressures of capitalism. And she writes about that extensively in her commentary on Sia's Strained Girl. And I don't know if anybody remembers the video for Chandelier, um, but uh, there's a famous dancer called Maddie Zegler who is dancing around. Um, and she definitely seems to embody uh, this kind of sense of frustration, um, anxiety and panic that I think is um, overcoming all of us, but uh, particularly young women at the moment. Um, so I drew heavily on my own experience and feelings during the initial writing process so although it was very much born out of my own experiences as a portfolio musician he does um, a lot of different things and is quite a lot of the time exhausted but also very happy and privileged that I'm able to do a career that uh, consists of most of the things I enjoy uh, it's definitely not without its pressures and so although I don't have much time to go into the intricacies of the, the music here I'm happy to answer any questions um, but a lot of the compositional choices I made were were based upon those feelings so hopefully you got a little bit from from that song um, and I suppose that the questions I'm looking into and trying to answer are sort of can songwriting as practice as research provide a catharsis specific to autoethnographical research I certainly found it um, cathartic for myself and for further research, how can we use this uh, to, to make an impact on other people? Um, so how can, how can we include women who are suffering from domestic violence, for example, in research and songwriting such as, as this, in a way that doesn't put them at risk, but, um, but also centers their own experiences and stories? Um, I think maybe uh, I, my role is to partly sort of facilitate that um, and um, to lay out a framework um, as I'm still exploring the methodology. Um, so thank you for listening to me ramble on. Um, I'm more than happy to answer any questions afterwards. Thank you. Is that the way? No, you're great. You're wonderful. Thank you, Kate. So next we have Janani with Conversations with Elise. Thank you. No dance or singing for me. Sorry, guys. I'm not a pharmacist. <laughs> you know, not a tenographer. Uh, so Conversations with Elise. I have seen Elise several times in Urban Champagne at the ICQI conference. We also met a couple of times online in the British Autotonography meeting, this meeting. So I can say that I liked her even before getting to know her. She's one of the facilitators at the Reengage the Body workshop in Devon, England, that happened a few weeks ago. This workshop happens uh, in three weeks into my sabbatical at the University of Edinburgh at the Center for Creative Relational Inquiry. I have several interesting, very interesting encounters with people at the workshop, but it's the ripples of my own talk about being a different kind of pharmacist and a qualitative researcher in a pharmacy school that are still gripping me. And that's where I turn my attention to today. Elise was spending a few weeks in England. So she went to the house in Cornwall. She invited me to spend a few days with her 
I was very grateful, but at the same time, I didn't want to, didn't want to be a burden by intruding into her space. I didn't know what to do, if I should accept or not, but in the end, I did. <laughs> we were both foreigners living in different countries, an American living in England and a Brazilian living in Scotland. Mm -hmm. In those four days, we engaged in what I call a learning about each other marathon. <laughs> We didn't stop talking. <laughs> Isn't it interesting how when we are away from home, we become more eager to connect with others? I guess our sensibilities become more uplifted. Elise and I share the feelings of joy about encountering the new, new spaces, new smells, new birds, new cultures, and very different people. We also share feelings of homesickness of missing what's familiar to us. It's challenging for us to take the bus, especially when they run on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> I tell her that I'm almost hit by a car in my first week in Africa. <laughs> and we miss our dogs, Sheba, my dog, and Maggie, her dog. That's probably the most difficult part for both of us. Our breakfast in that little table in the cozy oyster catcher facing a tall sand dunes were the most interesting moments Elise and I had. And where most of our conversations flowed, sometimes calmly and sometimes very passionate. At breakfast, Janani, I liked your talk at the workshop, but I still wonder what it's been like for you to be a pharmacist, like doing work with directly with patients and being a qualitative it's been a wonderful journey, Elise, but a very, very hard one. Tell me about it. Oh, it's wonderful because I can't imagine my life without uh, pharmaceutical care practice, which is what I do nowadays. That gave me the reason to wanting to be a pharmacist and wanting to be a teacher of future pharmacists. As a student, I love studying pharmacy, but mostly because I had fun at the university and I love the friends I made. I can't say I found meaning in the course or that I envisioned an interesting future for me in the profession. I got no understanding of or exposure to ideas related to my responsibilities as a healthcare professional. How could I improve someone's life as a pharmacist? Was I a health professional or a pharmaceutical engineer? I had no idea. Nobody had. I graduated with a Bachelor of Pharmacy at the time when the role of the pharmacist in patient care was non-existent. Patient care was not seen as something pharmacy students should be taught in a formal and systematic manner. Pharmacy school taught us about drugs. It was everything about drugs, how to produce them, how to analyze them, how to test the quality, potency, and how to think of the use in a population level. So we could buy and distribute those medications to the population. So when I started teaching 27 years ago, information about human beings was still considered a second level of knowledge. Yeah. People would make fun of me because I talked about patients. Oh. <laughs> I was ridiculed every day. <laughs> but my early journey as a faculty member, I found pharmaceutical care practice. It's a theoretical framework that tell me what, how I should work with patients. Pharmaceutical care brings the human to the profession and all the complexities and ambiguities that come with it. I experienced pharmacy as a, as a very arid, out of touch space until I realized that there was more to it than possessing a, lots of knowledge in my own head. I could apply knowledge. My knowledge was important and I could make a, make a difference in the world. How is that so, Janami? I'm sorry, but the only thing I know about pharmacists is that when I go to a drugstore, they ask me to get a prescription. They ask me, do you have a question about your prescription? And honestly, I have no idea what question I'm supposed to, to ask. <laughs> and we both laugh, right? <laughs> I, I do understand that, Elise, and it's so frustrating to me and so sad. You know, in pharmaceutical care, your pharmacy would sit down with you, get to know you as a person, and consider you, like your expectations, your experiences, as he or she goes through all your medications to make sure they're working well for you and they're safe for you. People like us, you know, patients, usually we create our own medication practices. We have feelings about our medications. 
We make decisions about them every day, how to take them, if we take them, if we don't take them. I mean, we do this every day. This has great consequences in one's life. Mm -hmm. Wow, this is amazing, John. I never heard about that. <laughs> you know, my responsibility is to work with patients to technically assess their medications, if it, they are efficient, effective, safe for them, but also to understand the meanings they have for people, how they fit in their lives, how we can make their experience a better experience with medications. Wow, it makes so much sense to me, Janani. I guess, you know, we really do our own things with medications, right? We have our own ideas about it. Like we do a lot of things with medications. I'm like, yeah, can you imagine? Like you go to different physicians, like you go to therapists, you go, you take supplements, your neighbor tell you like a medication should take, your mom, you know, your daughter. Like everybody has something to say about the medication, right? But how are all those things working for you? It can be dangerous. They can be working for you or they can be working against you. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine someone taking like 10 to 15 medications a day? What is going on? And that's mostly for our patients. patients. People in the community are taking on average like 12 medications a day. Oh my God, this is overwhelming. <laughs> really? I want a pharmacist. I need a pharmacist. I need a pharmacist to take care of me. Like, <laughs> wow, Elise, you should have that. I, you know, I really think that it should be a basic patient right. You know, that's kind of my battle, if I can say that we need to make sure pharmacists are prepared to do that to work directly with people to be able to speak multiple languages the language of science of pharmacotherapy but also the language of patients of human experience wow Janan, it seems like you are in a kind of a quest you know i kind of see you as a cartographer of possible pharmacy worries <laughs> that's a use you are navigating multiple roles like you're multilingual in a way that you connect traditional science and the science of peoples. Does that make sense? Oh, that's so interesting to hear that, you saying that. I never thought about that. Yes, I guess I'm in a quest for the last 30 years. I'm trying to build this world, you know, this alternate world in which pharmacists are part of the healthcare team. They have lots of knowledge about pharmacology, but also about human experience. They're interested, genuinely inter interested in people's stories. They are empathetic to their situation. They meet them where they are. Wow, Janet, it looks beautiful to listen to you saying these things. Yeah, I guess it is. But you know, that scares people. Many people, they feel very frustrated about the new possibilities that open by this new way of being in the world. I have so many stories about that, how they attacked me because they felt my ideas were interfering with their normal business as they knew it. It has not been a, a boring journey, that's for sure. Wow, I wonder about what, what type of battles you encountered, Janani. Wow, my, my body still remembers many stories, many difficult stories. But we need to go now, Elise, and, and, and I'll share some of you, or some of them with you later, okay? So like, fine, I can't wait to hear. Okay, that evening, as I walked the sand dunes at uh, Gritian Beach on the north coast of Cornwall, my conversation with Elise Rever reverberated on me. The wild nature of that place, the rough landscape of the dunes, the soothing sound of unknown birds, and the strong wind compete with a stream of thoughts about my life. My family, the death of my brother, my divorce, my stories of trying to build in different pharmacies, all connected. The role of qualitative research in all that. Mm -hmm. Everything seems to be connected. The challenges, the aspirations, the losses, the victories are all part of a puzzle of my journey in this road. The flow of thoughts is so fast that I can't capture them. Telling my stories to Elise is an invitation to review my life. I wake up and Elise already has a cup of fresh coffee for me. She does that every day. We still have some of those delicious croissants from yesterday. Interesting how our breakfast become our new ritual as we get to know each other, in our pajamas, as we build conversations over coffee and pastries, we attempt to find common ground. We create a home space, a safe space in which we can share our stories. It's like working with patients to provide holistic care, creating that safe space so they can express their needs, worries, without being judged. 
It's like trying to teach differently or do different type of research in a pharmacy school. As I look through the window, I observe the dunes and I think about how they're ancient and how they're made of sand that's constantly changing. And I think of the ocean tides that's also always moving and changing. It's like our lives, isn't it? Permanently moving and changing. But knowing that does not make change easy. Even though new is exciting, it's also uncomfortable and sometimes very scary. Like being a foreigner in a distant land, a Scottish land, away from home and trying to find that home space. Thank you. And um, next we have Danielle. Can you hear us? Danielle? I can. Can you hear me? And welcome. Um, just to introduce Danielle, she's going to present barriers to belonging, reflecting on the author's identity as a collaborator. Thank you. Um, let me just get this slideshow. Okay. Can you see my slideshow? Yes. Yeah. It's just loading. Oh, something happened. It stopped. Um, sorry, just a moment. Um, And then, there you go. Can you see it clearly? Yes. Okay, thanks. I'm Daniil, um, and I'm a postdoctoral fellow at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. So I'm very excited to be here. Um, I'll be presenting a paper called Barriers to Belonging, reflecting on the author's identity as a colored woman. So I start with a quote by Sylvia Winter in which she says, we as intellectuals need to center our struggles on an issue specific to us. Pan-African scholars have resisted race-informed knowledge projected onto them by colonialist and white supremacy. The colonial and apartheid history of South Africa offers Pan-African scholars a unique opportunity to counter prevailing racial identities in South Africa, particularly those deliberately forged to encourage the divide and rule strategies, such as the colored race classification. In post-apartheid South Africa, the contentious racial category of colored remains a racial category which perpetuates stereotyping and negative perceptions. In addition to this, colored people are torn between holding onto the apartheid racial classification of colored as their identity or rejecting the colored label and claiming a collective black identity. So who is colored? Colored people are made up of the many enslaved people from Indonesia, Malaysia, India, Madagascar, East Africa and West Africa that were coerced into sexual relations with Portuguese and European settlers, which was later termed miscegenation. It also refers to the sexual relations between European and Portuguese settlers with the Khoi, the San, the Nama and the Khikwa. This also includes sexual relations between the enslaved populations, such as those from Malaysia, India, Madagascar, etc., with the Khoi, the San, the Nama, and the Khikwas, which also produced racially um, diverse offspring. So this is just a picture of what some colored people look like. It's not in its entirety, but just to give you an idea of how racially diverse um, colored people are. 
So some of my extracts, and the first one is entitled Black Hair. When considering my appearance, it appears it reminds me of several experiences when Black, inclusive of colored and Indian women, would talk about their hair. They would encourage me by saying, your hair will be healthy, or your hair will be straight and easy to manage. On one of these occasions, I remember asking an Indian woman that appeared to have straight hair, why would you need to straighten your hair? It's already straight. Her response was, I've been doing it every couple of months. My hair is straight, but this product makes it even straight and easier to manage. I don't even need to iron it after washing it. I was quite shocked because I saw her as having good year, hair, yet she did not feel that her hair was good enough. I did not engage her further on the topic as I understand the importance of hair and women feeling good about their hair. The experience did, however, lead me to question how I felt about my own hair and whether it always needed to be iron straight to look healthy and good. Through the experience I recounted, I realized that the colonial and apartheid notions of beauty were still encouraged and enforced among black, colored and Indian women. We had internalized our racialized and gendered hair as unacceptable and therefore it needed to be straight. This situation mimics a form of finance neurosis of blackness as we project our insecurity and inferiority on one another. We were always policing ourselves to conform to the norm of whiteness, a standard that we could only reach by destroying the differences between us. We had become custodians of the oppressive ideology that we were subjected to. And in doing so, we were replicating the systems of oppression we had been enduring. The second extract is mixed race versus colored. I was told by a black woman of a conversation she had had with a white woman. The black woman informed me that the white woman had had a child with a black man. And after seeing the child, she asked the white woman, what race will you indicate for your child? Colored? The white woman responded to her, no, my children are not colored. They are mixed race. After hearing this, the black woman said to me she was not sure what to make of this, since to her the child looked colored. She went on to tell me that she had reason that perhaps owing to the couple being from opposite race groups, the woman had chosen mixed race to describe her child. On another occasion, during a different experience, I was in conversation with a white male, and we happened to speak about the same issue. And I said, so her children are colored? And the white male responded, no, colored is a race group. Her children are mixed race. She is white and the father is black. My experience was not unique as a study by Dalmage in 2018 also found that parents of mixed race children showed great resistance to identifying their children as colored and they are quoted as indicating they can never be they can be called mixed race, but they are not colored. That's the only word I can never use. And I get very offended if anyone calls my children colored. I find it a very confusing identity. The refusal of these parents to use the term colored expresses the transference of racial borders onto colored people as they've clearly internalized the prevailing truths about colored people. The negative perceptions about colored classification were perpetuated through the observed refusal to accept this category as a racial label for mixed race children. In this way, the ideals of white supremacy were being upheld and protected. Moreover, it was maintaining a color line. So some concluding thoughts. These experiences also made me consider my role in these circumstances. Was I complicit in my own oppression? Did this complicity facilitate belonging or a longing to be? Were these experiences merely historical and political influences that were intended to facilitate belonging in certain spaces and a lack of belonging in other spaces? My role in these circumstances is crucial for unpacking and contending with my identity. Similarly, Du Bois also highlighted these issues in his question, how does it feel to be a problem? My silence would not protect me, nor would it facilitate change. Although I recognize the spaces of non-belonging, I needed to ascertain whether I had unconsciously also participated in my own oppression. Was I perhaps still covered in the shame and unbelonging of the past apartheid? Or had I hoped to receive an acceptance from people in post-apartheid South Africa that they were not yet ready to provide? 
So to conclude, my narrative is by no means an argument for all colored women, as colored women are diverse and subscribe to different cultural practices. I nevertheless want to emphasize the pervasiveness of negative representations by oppressive systems such as coloniality and apartheid. Moreover, I seek to warn against internalizing an ideology that problematizes differences for the benefit of the oppressor. I argue for the collapse of colonial and apartheid race relations that cease to suppress the multidimensional characteristics of ethnic identities, such as the colored identity. This allows us to celebrate our authenticity in a world that thrives on reproducing differences as deviant. Thank you. We have about 20 minutes for questions. So if I could ask everybody who presented to come up. Thank you. Um, so thank you everybody does um that just open it up was anybody got any comments or any questions for any of our presenters yes I do. Um, Danielle, Dan, Danielle, and Krista. First of all, first of all, to Krista, do you feel that police relationship with the black community, especially over carnival, changed? Because I saw a picture the other day where um, a young black girl was winding herself up on a, a policeman and it made me really angry it's like why are you doing that okay this is such a it's a big subject and this is just an extract that i took from it and the reason why i was talking about the 1976 riot is because i was there yay mm -hmm. um but also we're looking at a time in 1976 where we didn't have the narrative that's the stereotype and the discourse that we currently have, that black youths are a problem. Mm -hmm. And at the time when I was pelting the stones, I really felt there was we were bringing about change. But what we actually did, we were very much um, part that created this change because this the media got hold of us throwing stones, throwing bottles, and that became the, the English, the British experience of black youths. So the image what, that you're talking about, there's always that image. There is always an image of a black woman skinning her teeth with a white policeman and got his, his helmet on. This is part of the same narrative yeah. where we're, it's okay, like we, we've been, we've been in court, we're part of the, the society. That's the positive image that's allowed to be shown, particularly black women, you notice black males mm -hmm. excluded. And then there is the black youth, and they're all running. They're running together continually. Mm -hmm. So that's the discourse. Okay. Thank you for that. And then now, um, you you said um, complicit in our own oppression. I think you were well. You were speaking about yourself, but I think that as black people, we often are complicit in our own oppression but the thing that really was interesting to me because I've got a friend who is biracial not mixed race and I found it interesting that you use the word mixed race rather than biracial and is that because actually um, within that mixture then there are other mixtures underlying it Um, so in terms of the mixed race, that's what we use or what that's what is mostly used in South Africa. Um, and it usually refers to opposite race groups in the sense of black and white binaries. Um, 
the mixture specifically usually refers to that. It doesn't really account for other mixtures. Um, yeah, so the biracial term, I've noticed in the literature is used in other contexts, but I haven't heard it being used here in South Africa. People usually just use the term mixed race. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? I'd like to come in on that okay. one, is that okay? Um, I think the term mixed race was, um, Actually, no. Mixed race comes in after half caste mm -hmm. because half caste is you're, you're just cast in half in Britain. So then mixed race came in, which personally I don't feel is a, is a better word in that it's what racism mix in. And I have colleagues who are dual heritage. And what I love about that is she explained to me because I'm coming from pre her, she's about 20 years younger. And she explained that it's reclaiming the word. So she's using the word mixed race as reclaiming it. Whereas I had seen it as something which was negative. And, That's interesting, yeah. And picking oh, up on our inter, we um, oppress ourselves. I think if, you're, if we're using the language, it depends on the context of the oppressed. If we're using it, um, have we internalized racism? So we straighten our hair because we have internalized that. I think that's a fair use of the language, but if we're using the word oppression, that's a different word. And it, it's really important when we're, when we're using words, especially when we're looking at race or sexuality, about to say, we oppress ourselves. No, we, we may judge ourselves or we may, um, be we may be negative about ourselves, but oppress is something where we're having to look at the power dynamics. And I think that's really important when we look at the power dynamics. Mm -hmm. Jelani, I'm interested in your two in the conversation. I know when we talked about Brazil, you talked about this issue and how it ranges from different areas in Brazil and how you experience racism in point of view because of how you perceive it from the past. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the Brazilian, I don't know if people know, ideas of race are very different. Like, I'm white in Brazil, <laughs> right? So I discovered that that's odd when I got to the United States and people would call me like a person of color, like a woman of color. I'm like, what? Mm -hmm. I mean, it was not derogatory or anything. Like, I was just like, oh, I'm Brazilian considered white, right? Because probably of my hair. I don't know why, but it's a it's a very I mean it's a very mixed place. Mm -hmm. You know, we have lots of Europeans. Uh, it was the oldest country, the latest country to abolish slavery in the world, I guess. I think in Brazil. Uh, so you know, we have it's a very mixed place. So the, our ideas of race is very different. Even what's black and what's white. I mean, we have like, um, I mean, very brown. You know, people. I don't know even how to say that. They 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 see themselves as white. And a lot of that is because of their social class too. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you are, I mean, if you're black, black, uh, like dark, mm -hmm. maybe it wouldn't matter too much. That's my, I mean, I don't study that. I don't know anything about it. Okay. I'm just saying like, as a person living in Brazil and who lived in the United States for many years too. But so if you are brown, not like black, but brown and you are middle class, you would be seen like a white. I mean, people would say, if the person would say, oh, I'm black or, and people are like, no, you're white. It's just because they're rich or they're middle mm -hmm. class. It's a completely different, it depends. It's very connected to social class. It's, it's fascinating mm -hmm. to me. Well, Krista said something really interesting. She used the word dual heritage and actually dual heritage is probably better than even biracial. Mm -hmm. Well, I think it's what it does is it doesn't dehumanize anyone. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we're looking at different her heritage, aren't we? When we're looking at race, it's like I keep on thinking dog and cat, or mm -hmm. or just something totally separate. Whereas it's it's it, we're human, and if we look at the ideology, it only just came to support slavery. So you yeah. you have to go right, right to the back, like okay, it started to do with slavery, pre-slavery. There wasn't the terminology. We didn't need the terminology. We were all human beings. And this is like having to deal with um, colonialism, capitalism, exploitation. And we're still, as people of 
if we choose color or African um, descent, still having to deal with this now. Yeah. Yes. And it has to be part of our conversation. Yeah. You know, am I dual heritage? Am I black? Am I blah, blah, blah. And this is why I like my all ethnographic work has said, no, we're all parts of the human race. Stop the color thing. Lovely. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, I, I, I just wanted to say thank you to all the panelists and um, kind of following on from that, but maybe zooming out a little bit, I am interested in the relationships between all the presentations in my mind, sort of looking around self-definition and definition by others. Mm -hmm. And um, is it Kate? Can you say thank you for your beautiful singing? Uh, thank you. <laughs> play. Um, I was wondering if you felt like that's so, like if that, well, any of the panelists really, like if you feel that that also goes along um, gender lines and um, sort of the, like the connection that you had with Elise in the over the breakfast, right? Um, and um, yeah, whether you feel like that that, that can be a, that that's relevant or can be applied to other categories than race, racial identities. Um, should I yeah. yeah. Um, so yeah, in terms of self identity and how I sort of identify myself, but that's um that's a question I feel like I'm always grappling with with, with songwriting, um because especially in the context of the song that that I performed. The problem is almost having too many, um, and I think, and and the fact that they're changing all the time. Like as I'm coming to the end of, of my twenties now, and even just something as as um, simple as defining yourself as a young person, especially within within the context of being a musician, which it, um, which is obviously it's um, you know you feel like you want to stay young for as long as possible. I mean we all do, but within the context of this industry and being a woman. Um, it's what you know whether or not you're defining yourself as conventionally attractive whether or not you think well that's going to change whether or not you're defining yourself um uh my friend said to me the other day I was getting really stressed about the amount I had on my plate and she said you need to realize that music's not necessarily something you are and I was like yes it is my whole identity and she said no it's, it's something you do um if you woke up tomorrow and you couldn't sing what would you do you'd find another way to express yourself and I thought wow that's really healthy look at us uh, growing as people <laughs> I thought that was a really interesting way, way of looking at it because yeah, you wonder about the balance of what identities have you been given by other people yeah. uh, specifically related to, to gender um versus what which ones do you agree with which ones are you going to engage with um, if not completely dismiss, um, and it's about um, being in this amazing position to have the privilege to have that that choice and be supported while you navigate these these things and these decisions. That's what I think. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thank you. That's been moving. Danielle, did you do you feel like that in terms of generational those categories that you discussed in your presentations, apart from like the racialized categories, do you think that there's change? happening in South Africa around generational identification, self-identification versus? So I can hear your question partially. Um, so you're asking if there's any change in how people self-identify now versus in the past. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah I think so. Um, to be honest, no. I think people are, because apartheid, the colonial system and the apartheid system, was so good at labeling people, people have also internalized those labels and they've clung to it. And some of these labels are actually, um, like I say, in, the, in terms of the colored identity, it perpetuates a lot of stereotypes and a lot, a lot of perceptions about um, the identity itself. And this was obviously deliberate because of the apartheid um, uh, system. They wanted to do this because they wanted black people to be separated. They didn't want them to forge any solidarity. So that same behavior you still see today, and it's still contested. I mean, as recent as I think a month or two ago, there was an Instagram post by one of the schools um, that was flagged by a newspaper as being very racist. And in those posts, they were saying very racist and derogatory things about Black people and colored people. And mostly what it pertained to was, um, especially with colored people, is their appearance. I think this, the, the quote they used was something like, um, 
colored people need to decide if they're black or white because they look like the Khoisan. Um, and in, essentially they, they're being very derogatory about how colored people appear um, and the fact that they need to choose some allegiance to which they are, which is very dif difficult because colored people have mixed ancestry. I, I think if I told when I said earlier about um, how colored people originated, it's a very vast um, ancestry. Um, and so there's no shared culture amongst colored people because obviously with the different mixtures that occurred, it, it creates a different culture and history, et cetera. So I think people are still caught up in that and they're not very educated in terms of knowing their history and knowing how mixed their ancestry is because a lot of this was erased and silenced. Um, and I think there's a movement to almost um, bring up those silence histories and revisit it so that people can revisit their identity um, and be more um, involved in, in identifying themselves and showing agency in that and not just having a label imposed on them. Mm -hmm. So I <laughs> hope that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that's really interesting. And like Krista said, that this is of people and other types of capitalists and control that we divide into each other and like we're this group and we're that group and white and that group. And, and outside when we're having lunch with Sally and Dan, you know, we're talking also about the work that has come to for the ERP. And it's really <laughs> say these animals, these annoying animals or annoying insects that come and annoy us and you know we have to get rid of them, even though they're so important for our survival. But how, for us, you know, if you as a white person, you know, how can we move forward to create, you know, this reality of that, we're all the, we're all the same. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. We are literally all the same, you know, we, we literally, if you look at like each other, obviously we all have different experiences and, and different cultures, so, but how can we really integrate them and understand each other and try to sort of zoom out from the, the constructs that we've built with each other? Well, I'd like to respond. I'd like to respond in that in these settings, we're actually sharing. And, and that's why I really love autoethnography, because um, as a black woman, actually saying, OK, as a black woman and having to own that, that I have to be black and then it's like take it politically. So we, we all have different things that we have to, to own. We're good, it's about undoing the structural. And that, that's really, so if we all can get, if we all get into places where we get an opportunity that we can actually challenge the yeah. structure, because we're good, we're great, we're all here. I don't feel I have any issue. I'm a human being here, I'm loved here. But the majority and, around the world because in my, in in the chapter i talk about taking inspiration from the rioting in Seto in south africa that we were being as black children watching this on tv we knew and our parents knew that we were being shown look what's happening to people who riot but what they didn't know was we were actually learning <laughs> so, <laughs> So in 1976, we had seen it and we were like, we're prepared to die too. So that's, that's the, so this is really great that you're here because it was your grandparents or parents who inspired us to like, we, we're experiencing the same apartheid, but of course, Britain's very covert, right. you know, it's so yeah. tidy, it really yeah. Yeah. carries itself that you believe it because we're multicultural, that it doesn't exist. But we were watching because they were showing we will do this to you. We understood the subjects of the, the things on the TV. Mm, so thank you. Oh yes, sorry. Who's that? Is that? Terry. Terry, hello. Hi, just wanted to share an anecdote. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, um, I was on a retreat with John Kabat-Zinn. He did a Zoom retreat at the beginning of the COVID lockdown. 
And he's the pioneer of mindfulness. So his students, former students were in attendance. There were 2000 people every day from around the world. And during that time was the horrific murder of George Floyd here in the United States. And what amazed me was that it impacted the entire world. And a lot of people on that retreat shared how they were reinvestigating their colonial history. You know, so just wanted to put that out there. It was such a remarkable, um, you know, I, it, it was shameful for me as an American that that, that actually happened in this day and age, because I was working the night of the race riots in the US, you know, back in the 70s. And with a black president, I thought, oh my gosh, we have really moved on. And that that event was just horrific. But the I just wanted to put it out there what an effect it had globally. So, thank you. Thank you, Terry. Would anybody like to respond? I'm sorry, it's me. Yeah. I want to respond, <laughs> but very quickly. I'm responding because. Thank you, was it Terry? Yeah. Terry, for bringing up about um, the event. This piece that I wrote is in response to that event. And it's in response because it wasn't written about. There wasn't, a, that Britain still refuses to actually acknowledge that from 1958, that was the first um, race riot, the Notting oh, Hill and Nottingham um, race riot. And then we had the 1976. It's still not being discussed or even acknowledged. So this is why I presented this piece and wrote this piece because supposedly through that event, we have all now starting to be more woke, <coughs> but it's who allows you to be woke, who allows the conversation. So this is why I'm really excited to be here and that there is at least a space in the world that exists that we can talk. Can we not call it a riot, but a crime? Oh, no, I called it a riot against the police. I didn't call it a riot. Thank you. Can um, we say a huge thank you to everyone? Oh, Elise wanted to say something. Oh, yeah. Elise. Oh, we're out of time. I'm sorry. No, oh, okay. I never have to talk to you. <laughs> I think she did that. So you did. Okay. I did. Uh, Krista, I always appreciate how gently and yet radically you position in our political contexts um, these very contentious, very charged terms that remind us that different representations and discursive strategies function. Um, to police us, so that it's not just a matter of what one's heritage and variety of histories, but that those play very, very differently. Um, and here also uh, in the US, the representation of George Floyd's murder, one of the ways that it played for many of my colleagues um, and colleagues of color was a fetishization of violence against black male bodies. And so while it's doing certainly rhetorical work, it's doing wounded uh, work as well. Um, Danielle, as I, I listened to you use the term colored and my first response, <gasps> oh, oh, okay, different context. Here in Arizona, we've got a representative who's just been called out for using the very historical term colored people, right? Um, which is coming out of our pre-civil rights uh, eras. And so these terms are so powerful and, and always important to contextualize them uh, within a particular cultural, historical, discursive uh, category. And Krista, you always do that for me so wonderfully. Thank you. If I can just add, um, colored is actually a legal classification still. So even in post-apartheid, it's still a legal classification. So if you fill out any documents, um, that's one of the categories that you fill in. Um, yeah, but I, I do know in the US, it, it's, a, it's a very violent term. I think in South Africa, it also should be, but because obviously people have internalized different things, it's not, um, but thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.